Thank you, God. Father God, we thank you for the day you've given us. We thank you for the way you've been blessed with and how you constantly provide us. We ask you to continue to bless us and bless us as we strive to live for you in overcoming temptations and in taking opportunities to serve and be an example to others. We're thankful for all who are here to worship you. We pray you'll help our, us keep our hearts and minds focused upon the occasion that our worship will be acceptable to our holy God. We pray these things in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Song for the Lord's Supper is going to be number 313. 313. We'll sing the first and second verse of 313. On a hill far away, scripture from Luke chapter 22. When the hour had come, he sat down with 12 apostles and the 12 apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have a desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And in verse 19, and he took the cup he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, gave it to them, eat to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. And as we come together on the first day of the week to remember Christ, 
Our dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this time that we have to assemble around this table to partake of this bread, which represents Christ's body as he died on the cross for the remission of our sins. May we partake of it in a manner well pleasing in his sight. In Christ's name, amen. Supper. The song for the offering will be number two. Number two. Sing the first verse only. Number two. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love. For Jesus, who died and is now gone above, hallelujah, thine the glory, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again.
The Lord needs to know that we trust him and we trust what he has planned for us in the future. And we can show this trust in many ways. We can obey him. We can believe in him. And each Sunday, we show that trust by a donation to the angels. And I have, I'd like to say a little prayer. Thank you for this, uh, thank you, Father, for this uh, wonderful day. And let us each one, Father, as we go through the day, help show our trust in you in the ways that you have set aside. We I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. How shall the young secure their hearts and guard their lives from sin? Thy word, the choicest rules impart to keep the conscience clear, to keep the conscience clean. Thy word is everlasting truth. How pure is every page. That holy book shall guide our youth and well support our Psalm for prayer is going to be number 791. 791. Sing both verses. 791. On bended knee I come with a humble heart I come, bowing down before your holy throne, lifting holy hands to you, as I pray. 
Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, humbly we bow before your throne. We are thankful for the ability to pray, and we know that you hear us. And Father, we know that you love us and care for us and that you are ever watching over us. Father, we're thankful for the congregation here at Shepherd, and we bless her work. We, bless, we pray that you would help us in building this congregation in faith and spiritual strength, but we are that we do the work that is given to us, given to us that we would spread your word and to teach others about us. And Father, help us in our strength. And Father, we also pray for the men who are supported, uh, the preaching students at Brown Trail Preaching School. We pray for them and their families as they continue in their studies. But Father, we pray for the ill of this congregation. We pray for those that, that are recovering from illness and dealing with long-term issues. We pray for them. We pray for Darlene Partain, who's dealing with the pneumonia the the continual reoccurrence of that help her in her strength to to be able to overcome these things and help the the doctors who are looking after her we pray for those that are recovering from surgery and uh, we pray for Dex as he's continuing to deal with the pain, associated pain, but uh, any other issues that have to do with that, continue to help him heal. And we pray for Russell and help him as he goes through therapy and as he prepares for the prosthetic limb and be with Roberta who's, who's helping him. We pray for <clears throat> Elsie Smith in Timberwood Nursing Home, help her. And we pray for Cynthia Rice. And we pray for Barbara Stripling, and we pray for good results with her tests. Father, we pray for those who are in need, spiritual need, where they are dealing uh, with struggles in their life, probably things that we don't always know about. Father, we pray for them. And Father, help us as a congregation to love one another, to take care of one another, and to ask questions in such a way that we're showing our care and love that but we're also to be able to lift them up and to help them to be encouraged to make necessary changes in their life, to correct any problems that, that are there, to repent of any sin that is there. But Father, it is a horrible thing when a child is lost to sin. And Father, be with this congregation as we work together. Father, we are so thankful for Donald and Alicia coming to work with us here, and we pray for Donald as he presents the lesson. This morning, be with us in, in our minds that we're concentrating on, on the sermon and that we're learning. And Father, be with us as we continue in our worship in song and in prayer. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. All right. The song for the lesson is going to be number 549. 549. Go ahead and sing all three verses of 549. There is sunshine in my 
Please mark your sum books to number 948. 948. Brother Donald? As you are taking your uh, Bible out, you can reach into your bulletin this morning. And you will see there is a sermon supplement that you can use to follow along this morning if you choose to. Uh, basically, I'm giving you my sermon notes. Uh, the things that I'm going to cover in the sermon are going to be right there. The, the scripture verses that I'm going to make reference to are, are going to be on there. And you'll be able to follow along. Now, I know that not everybody likes an outline. Some people don't want to know what direction we're going, uh, you know, or they, they look at it and think, oh, no, he's going to take a whole 10 minutes to go through this. But uh, uh, if, if, if that's how you are, just tuck it in your Bible. Just tuck it in your Bible and, and you can refer to it uh, later if you'd like to. But, but essentially, I'm, I'm just giving you my, my sermon notes. We're talking this morning about home sweet home. And, and what we're going to do is explore the different rooms that are in our spiritual house. Now, we'll say more in just a moment about our spiritual house. But I want you to remind you of something that took place in Luke chapter uh, uh, nine, uh, 15. If you want to turn over there. And beginning in verse 17. And it's the story of the prodigal son. And if you remember, the prodigal son says to his father, give me everything that, you know, is going to be my inheritance. And he gives it to him and he takes it away. And do you remember what he does? He squanders it. He wastes it. And he finds himself, this, this son, finds himself in a situation where he's in dire need. I mean, things are pretty bad. He, he's a Jewish person working with the hogs. That's about as low as you can get. And he comes to a realization and that realization is, you know what? At my father's house, back home, things are better. 
And he comes to the realization that that's where I need to be. And we pick up in, in verse 17, and it says this, But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this son that for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found and they began to be merry home sweet home we don't know how long the prodigal was, was away from home. We don't know how long it, it, it took in, in actuality. I mean, uh, what, was it a year, two years? Was, well, how, how long was it that he was away? But we know this. He came to the point when he realized, you know what? Home is better. And home is where I want to be. And he goes through his, his, his thinking. He says, you know what? I'm going to go back and I'm going to present to my father that, you know, just, just kind of treat me like a stranger. Treat me like a, a hired hand. I, I'm not worthy to be your son, but I want to be home. I want to be home. And as he makes that journey, he goes through these things in his mind. Thinks about the hired hands and how they're taken care of. He thinks about the actions that he did and how he took from his father and squandered all of his inheritance. And he thought about the need to be repented. And when he gets back, he, he says to the father what he had planned to say. He's back home again. And he says, it wasn't right. I was wrong. I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you. And I shouldn't have done all of that. And the father does this. Welcome home. You don't have to convince the prodigal son of that saying, home sweet home. He lived it. Now I make mention there on the top of your outline, if you want to notice that home is a very special place to us. Home is this place where, where we as a people come to rest, right? Where we can kind of recharge ourselves and re refresh ourselves and have that time of, of rest. It's a time where we come and we feel that we're safe from the world. That we can kind of push everything away and we can, we can have our mind at, at ease. We come to see that when we come home, it's, it's, it's where we uh, just want to get away from it. We want to push away the rat race. We want to just have some downtime. What is home to you? How do you feel when you get home after a long day? How do you feel in your, your home when there's a storm raging outside? Do you, do you feel safe in your home? Do you feel that, well, I'm glad that I'm in this place. This is where I need to be when everything around me is kind of just in turmoil. That's home sweet home. Now, I'm going to suggest to you this morning that it's not just the prodigal who learned this. I think we learn it as well. But let's take it a step forward. You know, in your home, you have different rooms. And, and those different rooms have different purposes. You, you do different things in that room. And we kind of set our homes up for things that we're going to do in this room, we put in that room. And things that we're going to do in this room, we arrange it this way. And it kind of makes sense to us. And it becomes convenient. And we begin to know all the rooms and their function and their purpose in our house. What if, it's what we're looking at this morning, what if you looked at your life as being a spiritual house? 
What would it look like? What, um, what would the rooms in your spiritual house be filled with? How would you feel or how do you feel when, when, when you sit back and realize that, that this is my spiritual house? What is the condition of that house? Is it doing okay? Does it need a cleaning? Does it need a remodel? What is the condition of that spiritual house? I want to make some suggestions to you this morning. I want us to go through a spiritual house and I want us to think about the different rooms that are contained in it and, and what those rooms represent to us. The first thing that we'll notice is that in our spiritual house, we have what we would call the study. And for us, that equates to our mind. Our study is that place where we go when we want to get the intellect fired up. The study is the place that we go when we want to contemplate things and come to a better understanding of things. Kind of, kind of reason, not only with just ourselves, where am I, what am I doing, why am I doing it, but kind of make sense of the world. You know, what's it doing? Why is it acting this way? How's it impact me? And all of this is taking place in the, 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 the spiritual study of our mind. We process these things. What's your mind filled with? Could you say that if you enter this room, the study, would you be able to say that, you know what, I'm, I'm feeling, filling my mind with, with those things that are going to be beneficial to me. I mean, I mean the important thing. And I try my best to keep my mind active. I don't want it to grow dull. I want it to be alive and, and working for me. So when it, when it comes to my mind being that spiritual study, I'm doing all that I can to grow in my knowledge and my understanding. Certainly in my knowledge and understanding of the Word of God and what God wants for me. Turn over in your Bible to 2 Timothy 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I want you to notice verse 15, what Paul says to Timothy. He says, be diligent. I, th I think you have to pause there. We're talking about our mind, our spiritual study. And he says, be something very specific. Be diligent, not careless, not haphazard. Not without giving any type of, of thought or not putting any type of, of, of effort into it. He says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study! I have to apply the word of God to my life. I have to be one who has the mindset that says, I want to get into God's word and I want to dig deep. I want to come away with a better understanding. I want my, my spiritual study to be a place of growth. A place where I began to, to expand my understanding of things. We see over in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Paul gives us the understanding in, in these words beginning in verse 5. That our mind is a place of reason. Reason. He says this, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. One has a mind of the flesh, one has a mind of the Spirit, and it matters what mind you and I have. And he goes on and he says, For to be carnally minded, that's a mind on the flesh, is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Could there be a bigger contrast? He goes on and he says, because the carnal mind, he gives us this, this explanation of, of why the carnal mind is the way that it is. And he says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So we go on and we have this understanding that, listen, where my mind dwells or what my mind dwells on 
is going to have an impact on my relationship with God. If you want to ask yourself, how's my relationship with God? Is it strong and active or, or is, do I feel that it's a little bit distant? Ask yourself, how are you doing in your study? How much time are you putting into your study? How much time are you learning God's word and the application to your life? It's a terrible thing to neglect our spiritual study. To let our mind grow dull. Here's another room. It's, it's the kitchen. And in the kitchen, you will find your desires. It's where the recipes begin to start flowing. It's where you begin to get creative and explore different things. You know, the kitchen is that place where you're mixing and, and making everything up. And everybody wants the kitchen to be a place where, where good food is. Right? Where the tasty things are. The things that we enjoy are our favorites, if you will. And the kitchen, just like the study, shouldn't be neglected. Go over to the 145th Psalm, Psalm 145. And I want you to go down and notice it's almost towards the end of the, the book of Psalms. Psalm 145. And notice these words in verse 19. He says, He will fulfill the desire of those who fear Him. He also will hear their cry and save them. Do you desire what is good for you? Is that where you are as a person of faith? I desire the godly things in my life. Right? I desire those things that are going to make me a better husband or spouse or individual or, or, or parent. I desire those things that are going to build me up in this world and, and help me to be better. It's where my desires lie. We should always be a people, according to Philippians 4 and verse 8, who, who desire that which is good according to God. Because there are things that man may say is good, but God would say, no, put the brakes on. That's not going to be something that's beneficial to you. It's not going to work well in your life. In fact, it's going to harm your relationship with me. So we should desire those things that are going to be good for us. Go over to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And I want you to look at verse 33. Jesus is the one who's speaking. And he says, Of our desire, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Do you desire the kingdom of God? This is your spiritual kitchen where you're putting all the ingredients together. Do you desire God's righteousness? Is it what you want, not, not just for yourself, but is it what you want for your brothers and sisters? I want them to have that same desire. I want their kitchen to be making, oh, how can I say it? Um, uh, the same recipe. I want them to be producing in their kitchen what I'm producing. And that's a, a, a better life with God. A stronger, more committed life with God. Where, where my desire falls on those things that God would say, I approve of. How's your spiritual kitchen? We go on and we see that we have a living room. And in this spiritual house, the living room represents our friends. Those people that we make time with. And this is important because, listen, we're a busy people. We've got things that we need to do. We've got places that we need to be, right? We're always in a crunch. We're always racing against the clock. We're always wishing that I just had a little bit more time, just a, a few more seconds. Just, just if things would just slow down just a little bit. And when we give our time over to somebody, that's a big deal. What? Do our friends help us do with our time? Are our friends those who are going to build us up and help us to be better? Or are they going to harm us? Go over to, to uh, 1 Corinthians. You're in Matthew. You have to turn uh, forward in your Bible. Go over to 1 Corinthians <clears throat> uh, chapter 5. And verse 11 says, but now I have written to you, this is Paul dealing with immorality in, in Corinth, okay? 
He says, but now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. Paul's dealing with immorality. He is is dealing with one who is sexually immoral in chapter 5, and they were accepting of it. So even if it's a brother or sister in Christ, we have to be cautious with our time and where we're willing to spend it. And Paul says that there comes a time when we're looking at our company, those who are in our life, that we have to see what type of company are they. Are they good? Or are they bad? The writer of Proverbs chapter 13, turn back to your Old Testament. In Proverbs chapter 13 and in verse 20, the writer says that, that the wrong friends can harm us. He says, he who walks with wise men will be wise. We gain and grow from their knowledge. But the companion of fools will be destroyed. Now, this may come across a... a, a, How do I want... This may come across a little harsh. But when you think about the friends that you have in your life, do they make you wise or do they make you foolish? What type of relationship do you you have with them? Paul goes to talk about this thing specifically, about the influence that they have. If you go back over to 1 Corinthians, but go to chapter 15 this time, and if you look down there in verse 33, Paul talks about company. He talks about the people that we're spending our time around. And he says, do not be deceived. Don't, don't, Don't let this, don't be fooled. He says, evil company corrupts good habits. He doesn't say that your habits weren't good. He doesn't say, or he's not saying, that you weren't faithful in serving God. He's not saying that you weren't one who was putting aside the commandments of God and accepting the wrongs of man. He doesn't say that. This individual has good habits. But what does Paul say? Evil company corrupts those good habits. The spiritual living room is those friends that we have. What type of friends do you have? We're working our way through this spiritual house. We've seen the study and the kitchen and the living room. And now we come to the bedroom. And the bedroom represents your morals. The bedroom is that place of privacy. The bedroom is where we go and we close the door and we have this this personal time, this alone time. It's where we leave the world on the other side of it. It's a place where we come to reason and understanding what is good and godly in our life. Our our spiritual bedroom says what our actions reveal about our decency. Look at 1 Peter. You're in 1 Corinthians. Keep turning forward in your Bible. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. And look at these words beginning in verse 15. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Is that what my decency reveals? Is that the the type of goodness and purity that I have in my life? Am I trying to have a decency in which God would say, well, you're living holy. You're giving yourself over to those types of morals that are only going to strengthen you and, and, and help you as you work your way through this life. You know, the the Bible tells us if you turn over to Galatians, Galatians chapter um, 5, and if you notice beginning there in, in verse 16, you see an opposition at work. You see a contradiction at work. And Paul says, I say then, walk, verse 16, I say then, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We're, we're talking about our morals. We're talking about the spiritual bedroom. We're talking about our purity. 
He says, for the flesh lusts, lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. There's more. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why? They're not decent. They're not godly. They are those things that we could step back and, and he says it himself and the like. It's not an exhaustive list. There's more that's out there. And he says, listen, these things aren't going to produce in your life the purity that God wants you to have. You can't go back and say that I'm going to be holy as God is holy and have idolatry and sorcery and jealousies and murders and drunkenness. It doesn't work that way. We're striving for purity in our life. He goes on and he says in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit, and here's the contrast. These two things are opposites of one another. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. You catch that, right? God never made a law and bound it upon the Jewish nation that they, couldn't, they could only love so much. He never created a law that said, well, I only want you to be kind to a, to a certain point, and even after that, you don't have to be kind anymore. He never set a law on faithfulness. Right? You see where he's going. He never set a law on gentleness. These things can be done in abundance. These things are good. They're producing in us purity. Look how opposite they are from the works of the flesh. He says, and those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Purity. Standing in the presence of God and saying that I am doing my best to be a moral individual. To do those things that are going to be good and godly. And I want to put out the works of flesh. And I want to bring in that, that fruit of the Spirit. What does your spiritual bedroom say about your morals. Here's a, another room. We're working our way through this spiritual house and it's, it's the closet. And maybe we don't always think about this. I mean, the closets are set off to the side somewhere. You know, the, the closet doesn't take uh, preeminence in the middle of the, the living room. Well, we don't say, man, I, I wish I had a big co uh, uh, closet right in the middle of my island in my kitchen. Closets are put off to the side. They don't become the center of attention. In our spiritual house, the closet represents our secrets. Those things that we don't want anybody to know about. We'll take it a step farther and say that in this spiritual closet is where we put the things that, well, <laughs> they just embarrass us. Oh, we know that they're not right. That's why we hide them. We know we'd be horrified if somebody knew about them, so we, we tuck them in, the, in the, the very back of the closet. We, we hide them and we put whatever we can in front of them so that, that nobody will ever see them or come, come to, under, uh, to know that we're, we're doing these things. We harbor these secrets. Now, we can hide those secrets from one another, and we become very good at it. But we can't hide those secrets from God. I guess in essence, what I'm saying is God knows what's in your closet. He's aware of it. Go over and, and notice these words. Turn back to your Old Testament and, and go to the book of Psalms. And notice in Psalm 90, these words in, in verse 8, just one verse. He says, you have set our iniquity before. These, this is uh, uh, to God. You have set our iniquities before you. 
He says, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. God, you know me. You know me in an intimate way. You know what the secret is that I'm keeping from the world around me. You know not only what that secret is, you know, Father, because you understand me. You know the reason behind what I did and why I did it. God opens up that spiritual closet and he says, I'm going to come in whether you like it or not. I'm going to see what's in there whether you like it or not. But I've hid it way back here. God won't find it. It's all laid bare to him. We can put as much junk in front of our secrets as we want to, but they're not hidden from God. Go over to Hebrews chapter 4. This is the very point that the author of Hebrews is writing. And if you notice in verse 13, these words are found. He says, and there is no creature hidden from his sight. This is God. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. The Greek word there for all is pos, P-A-S. And it means absolutely everything. All of it. Nothing held back. Nothing put to the side. Nothing kept over here. Uh, he says, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. I, I, I guess a, a sobering way to think of this is what you see over there in in Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 2, in these words in verse 16, our secrets will be judged. Does it matter if I try to hide this from God? Well, sure it matters. He says this, Paul says, In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. What's your closet look like? Oh, I mean, that's, that's, your, that's your space. It's not for me to go into your closet. It's certainly not my responsibility to clean out your closet. It's your responsibility. And it's a cleaning that needs to take place hand in hand with God. Saying, here I've been hiding this, but I'm, I'm bringing it to you. I know you know it, but I, but I have to confess it. I have to say it. I have to be honest. Even if it's embarrassing, I did this. I'm seeking your forgiveness. There's a phrase that's used today, and I don't say this in a humorous way. There's a phrase that's used today for a person who is gay coming out of the closet, meaning they're going to reveal their sexuality uh, to the world. But, but let me take that away from them. We need to be individuals who come out of the closet. I wasn't created to live in the closet. I wasn't created to spend my, my life in the closet. This wasn't created to be my place. This is a place that becomes for me a prison. What's the condition of your spiritual closet? Here's another one. The attic. And maybe we don't often think about this. This is our spiritual attic. This is our past. And, and we're real good at being a people who don't get rid of things. We build homes with two-car garages, but we can't get our car in the garage. You know why? Because it's filled with all of our stuff. We hate to give something away. And so the, the attic represents those things that, that, that you store, you, you tuck away. When I think of the attic, I always think of the, the Christmas tree. You know, we, we enjoy it for, for a couple months and then we, we just put it away in the attic and we forget about it. I mean, it's up there. It's, it's not being used. It's collecting dust and we forget about it till the following year when we go up there and bring it out. And sometimes we take those things that are not good for us and we pack them, pack them away in the attic. And, and, and the time comes when we say, well, let me go get it. But you didn't need it in the first place. Let me go through all the stuff that's up there and, and dig it out and, and bring it down here. You don't need it. Our attic is that place where the, the junk collects. Listen to Philippians chapter 3. You're in Romans. Turn forward in your Bible. Philippians chapter 3. 
And notice these words that Paul says, beginning there in verse 12. I'll give you a, a couple of verses here. And Paul says, not that I have already attained, verse 11, verse 10, and verse 9 will give you the context of what he's saying. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. If you go into the presence of God and you say, God, I did it. I committed this sin. I was wrong. I did it intentionally. I know it was going to produce this. I know no good was going to come from it. I did it and I confess it. Don't pack it back in your attic. Throw it out. Get rid of it. We see in the Old Testament book of, of Isaiah. These words are recorded in, in, in Isaiah chapter 43. And beginning there in verse 18. Do not remember the former things. Doesn't mean we don't learn from the past. He says, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. He goes on and he says in verse 25, go ahead and, and look down there. He says in verse 25, he says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. It's the blood of Christ that makes us pure, that makes us forgiven. John talks about it in 1 John chapter 1. That as a people of repentance, we as Christians come into the presence of God and we seek forgiveness and God grants forgiveness. He doesn't tell us, climb back up the steps, put it back in the attic, and when you need to, go drag it down the steps again and rehash it all over in your mind. He says, I blotted it out. Then why is it still hanging around in our attic? What you value the most. What is of the most important? Go over to Matthew chapter 6. Whatever is the most important to us is the things that need to be stored in the attic so we have access to them. So that they're useful to us. And it's a matter of are we putting in our attic those things that are useful or those things that are junk? Jesus says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. He says, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What treasure is in your attic? Is this something that's going to rust and mildew and fade away? What treasures in your attic? Is it something that somebody can, can break into your house when you're not around, climb up those stairs and say, oh, I like this, I'm taking it. What's in your attic? Is it those things that are going to be beneficial to you so you know you need them and you can access them? We're talking about taking a tour of our spiritual house. We're working our way through this house when we come to the laundry room. And the laundry room is a place of dirt. The, the laundry room is a place where we, we need to get things clean, right? Uh, we need to come and we need to do whatever can be done so that when the, when, the, when the things come out of the laundry room, they smell good, they look good, they, they, you know, they have a great appearance to them, and they're useful. Christ puts us through a spiritual laundry room. He cleans us. I, I want you to notice these words over in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. And I'll remind you of the context. Paul is retelling his conversion experience to the individuals. And he says this. And now why are you, after talking uh, to, 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 to him, he says, And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Calling on the name of the Lord. Paul, be baptized. 
The only way that our sins in this spiritual laundry room can be taken away is if we are people who have submitted to the command of baptism that washes away the sins of our life. You know, only baptism can do that. There, there's an, a, an, accounting in, a, an accounting in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 10, where all these things are mentioned, where Paul says, this is who you used to be. This is how you used to act. This is the type of things that you used to give yourself over to. But he ends it by saying, but you were washed. You went into that spiritual laundry room, and Christ, through his blood, made you clean. When's the last time you used your laundry room, your spiritual laundry room? It's the last time you said of God, cleanse me from this sin. Purify me of those things that are wrong in my life. There's one more place in your house. One more place. And that's your garage. And the garage, I will suggest, suggest to you, represents your mobility. Your, your ability to... To, to get out there and, and do the things that you need to do. The garage is moving. The garage is active, right? The garage is a place where we, we come and then we go. We, we come and then we go. We're always doing what we can to, to get out there into the world. You see that in places like Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, when we're told to share the gospel to all creation, to take it out to all the world. We see that when it comes to our mobility, that even in the face of persecution and danger, and that's what's taking place in Acts chapter 7, the church is being persecuted. Even Saul is there. And in Acts chapter 8, they're, they're being persecuted and spread abroad. But in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, and in Acts chapter uh, 1 through 5, we see that they went out and they did something very specific. They preached the word. You see, don't let your, your spiritual driving, don't, don't, don't let it stop because there's a few bumps in the road. D don't let your spiritual driving be stopped because, well, I, you know, I know when it comes to that individual, there's a pothole. Or I know when I've tried to deal with, with this individual, I mean, the guardrail had fallen off the side and there was just a cliff. Don't allow those things to, to harm or prevent your mobility. Get out there and get after it and take God to the world. How long? How long have you been sitting in your garage? How long has your spiritual car been parked? Collecting dust. I know something about cars a, a little bit. Engines are made to run. An engine is its happiest when it's running, when all the components are working together and everything's clicking and, and, and going. That's what an engine was designed for. It was designed to run. It was designed to go. And that's what we are designed for. To run. To go. If you notice there at the bottom of your outline, I, I say this in conclusion. I say, what's the condition of your home? And, and, and that's you. You, you. you answer that. You know your spiritual home better than anybody else. You know the layout. So I say, what's the condition of your home? And I ask this question. Does it need a complete remodel? You know, sometimes it does. I got to get out there and I got to wipe that attic out. I got to get it clean. I need to put up new sheetrock. I need to do what I can. There's boards up there that, that are falling apart. I, need, I just need to remodel. I need to get down there into my study. And my study just needs to be started over again. And I need to repanel the walls and, and do these things. Does your spiritual house need a remodel? Or maybe your spiritual house, well, it just needs a cleaning. I, I need to tidy up my living room. You see, I need to be mindful of the friends that I've allowed to come into my life, whether they are non-Christians or Christians. I need to tidy up that living room and be careful who I allow in it. Who's your company? The, the calling from Scripture is a simple one. Home sweet home is not just a physical reality. I mean, it is. But home sweet home has a spiritual existence. How's your home? 
as your home. I want to extend to you this morning the, the gospel plan of salvation. If you're here this morning and you have not become a Christian, then the, the plea of Scripture is that you become one. That through the gospel plan of salvation that you hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. And when you know those things and understand those things and are able to, to reason through those things, then, then if that's you and you've reached that point, then you're ready to be clothed with Christ in the baptismal waters. Right? You're ready, to, as Paul did in Acts 22 and verse 16, to have your sins uh, remitted. You're, Galatians 3 and verse 27, you're being put in Christ. If you haven't obeyed that plan of salvation, you need to. If you're here this morning and you just, you just need some encouragement, can we help you? Can we strengthen you? If you're subject to the invitation, why don't you come forward as we stand and sing. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity we've had to come here this morning and worship and study your word. And pray that we take these things that we've learned and apply them to our lives. And pray that uh, you be with those that are sick and shut in and help them to get well and be with those recovering and help their recoveries to go well. Uh, be with those that recently lost loved ones and comfort them only as you can, Lord. And be with this congregation and Pray that the decisions that we make here and the work that's done through this congregation is pleasing to you, Lord. Just be with us and bring us back this evening for our next service, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.